to start with. So for us, his training is many things to many people. But for me, his following club has always been an inspiration. There must, must be a be beginning to any great matter, continuing until the end, until the end, until it be thoroughly finished. finished. He was the true glory. My, My story tonight is to take a look at the right. I started when I became writer at 14. For some reason unknown to anyone, including myself, I decided to write verse plays, and therefore spent hours copying out lines of Shakespeare to learn the rhythms and nuances of the verse. My school work suffered, and unfortunately, there was no such thing as a creative writing course in those days, so my passion had to remain at a time consuming sideline. My first play, Cromwell, was about the English Civil War and was a runner-up to the 1982 Television Southwest Southwest Arts playwriting competition. I attended a weekend seminar and workshop with Stephen Lowe at the Barbican Theatre and came away with one resounding piece of advice ringing in my ears. Keep going. The reason I wrote the play was because the period is a fascinating subject to study and its resolution paved the way for the establishment of the Western world's democratic principles that remain fundamental today. I wanted to show how easily a society can descend into chaos and to study the fragility of the human condition. The idea that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely were also become major themes. The play had two main characters, King Charles and Oliver Cromwell, and the development of their characters is reflected in the destiny of the Civil War itself. I wanted to show how in the natural order our lives are danced with partners, seen or unseen, and how forces that seem in opposition to each other are often the same force. To help with the narration, I had scenes with two printers who were producing pamphlets. And uh, here is one of them talking at the end of the play. The printer. Does anyone know where a drama starts? What is the moment that begins an act and sets in motion a chain of events which, little by little, engross us all? The story here is one of a, revol a revolt which blew itself into a rebellion and became a bloody revolution. What are the moments that shaped its course? Often it would seem a combination of small events that creates the change we decide to shape into a story. So when did the English Civil War begin? A revolution that was to change the world, indeed to many, turn it upside down. Was the trigger a king seen as a tyrant or rebel inspired by his destiny? Was it Charles or was it Cromwell? Was it Prince Rupert or Fairfax, Pym or Hamden? Was it Henrietta Maria? Was it the smaller members of the cast, royalists and parliamentarian, Presbyterian or independent, Catholic, Levellers, Ranto or Raver? Did the dispute walk in the rooms of Whitehall or stalk the corridors of the Commons? Did war begin wrapped around the fires of the poor, sitting hungry for power as they talked their miserable winters away? There were so many lives, so many ideas, so many events threaded delicately together by the warped old hands of fate. Who with certainty can say where it did begin? Mentors were hard to come by back then, but Chris Robinson from Plymouth College stepped up. He always encouraged me and his advice has always been valuable, especially since he has forged a very successful career as a writer and historian in Plymouth. a thankless task. In those days, you actually had to physically print the script off, put it in an envelope with a stamped address one attached so they could be sent back. And then you had to wait for at least three months for the inevitable rejection letter. And I was up against it. Most venues only wanted small plays and nobody wanted to deal with verse. And here's an advice break. Always write what you would like to see on stage. Be confident with your style and get the establishment to see the world from your perspective, not theirs. Getting nowhere fast, I just set up my own theatre company to produce my plays. In 1986, I set about doing just that with my new play, The Mega Hunt, a fantasy set in space, which predicted that in the future, political leaders would be elected to power through a talent competition. <laughs> Perhaps a little bit ahead of my time. <laughs> So, if we've got <coughs> Chris's son, like you said, 1996. Sorry, 1986. Yeah. Correct. 1986. So, quite a long time ago. 
So this was the magazine that we produced. The mega hype is coming. And we actually produced a magazine which raised quite a lot of money. It's something that um, Plymouth presented it all the way through. We, we did raise money through uh, quite a lot of advertising. So the mega hype. What did I do to get attention? Well, that was fun. At the time, the BBC were running its own programme called Arts Southwest. I'm always looking for stories. I was looking for a venue and thought about the Palace Theatre, which had become a nightclub called the Academy. I then arranged the hype. I told the Academy that I wanted to produce a play on their stage from seven o'clock in the evening till 10, before they opened up a nightclub. Sort of a ground sharing agreement. They would give me the stage for nothing. I would take ticket sales. They, the bar receipts. I also told them I was going to be on the BBC, which was the winner. I then went to the BBC and said, I'd struck this amazing deal to produce at the Academy nightclub to run from seven till 10 in order to have a free theater. They liked the idea and gave me a 10 minute slot. I found a small band of fellow enthusiasts. And we held auditions at the Academy in front of cameras. You can imagine the crowds and lo and behold, I had a theater company, which because it represented talent from throughout the city, named Plymouth Presents. Of course, the slight problem was I'd never produced a theatre play before, and it showed. There was a crowd of a couple of hundred people for the opening night, which was great. Part of the crowd was the eminent theatre critic from the Evening Herald, Harvey Crane. Not aware of how to treat him, he'd had a queue in the rain with everyone else, and was not given the customary gin and tonic. I'd not talked to him about the show beforehand, big mistake. The production was troubled to say the least, but we staggered to the finish and won some half-hearted applause. Then came the review. Headlines. The Evening Herald. The mega hype didn't even deserve the title mini hype. <laughs> and I can remember these lines <laughs> the day I died. This will be on my tombstone. In all my time, I've been to literally hundreds of new productions. And I've always tried to be lenient on the first attempt. However, this was by far the worst ever. I won't embarrass any of the cast by naming them, <laughs> because most of the blame is lie with the writer and producer, Chris Avery. I suggest in the future you get dancers that can dance, singers that can sing, and actors that can act, and so on. As a result, a third of the cast disappeared overnight. But the show must go on, and we got to Saturday to the relief of all. I had stepped my toe into the theatre world and got extremely scolded. However, on a positive note, I'd certainly made an impression. I also had some songs I written which I thought were quite good, and indeed, they're going to be part of my next project. I won't sing to you now. I was going to sing a song, but <laughs> I'm going to leave that one for, on the advice of the stuff I think. So, after my wobbly start with the Meg Hype, I got a job in Next Coffee Bar, which I don't know if you remember. And on the first day there, I met a fellow barista, Danny Fleet, an aspiring director and producer. And guess what? By the end of the day, we'd resurrected Plymouth Presents. Our new play was my original work, Cromwell. And in December 1986, we opened at the Globe Theatre to a reasonable audience. And here we go. Poster designed by Chris Robinson. Regrettably, there was no theatre critic around then because Harvey Crane had died a month after he wrote his last ever review. Mega hype. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's true. <laughs> I, managed to get, I managed to get a sealed not reenactment society involved, and the play was quite well received. But the last night went especially well until the interval. Unfortunately, I don't know if you know the globe, but there's actually a bar right next to the backstage, and the cast were already celebrating the run. <laughs> before the second half. After about 25 minutes, I ran in to get them out and make sure that they finished the second half. A little bit the worse for wear, they had Running a theatre company from a coffee bar was unique. And Roger Malone of the Western Morning News wrote a full page article for the stage entitled Coffee Bar Checkoff. I even had a photograph. Plymouth Presents was alive and kicking, but I was running out of scripts. 
Chris Robinson then suggested I write a play about some Plymouth lads as a comedy. I mean, Plymouth lads, they're not funny, are they? <laughs> so was born the fictional town of Wayport and its three heroes, the lads, otherwise known as Kevin, <laughs> Eddie, and Brian. We produced the play Clash of Wheels at the College of Art and Design and sold out every night. It was my first comedy, and what was interesting was how the audience reacted. From our start on Wednesday to the final night on Saturday, the last had completely changed, but in a good way. In fact, the last night remains for me one of my theatrical highlights. Especially the whole audience came to the pub at the start of the show and just wouldn't let us out of character. The star of the show was Kevin, played brilliantly by Andy Blackwell, and people would not let him get out of character. A night to remember and the thing I've stuck to. In fact, for my MA, I did another sketch with the lads called Buffalo Miss Frick, which is going to be performed at Marjons in June, and we've already booked it to run on the, at the end of a fringe online. Um, now, I'm just going to have a go at this, because this is a bit of fun. I'm going to be four characters here, so bear with me. But this is the sort of comedy from the lads. So we've got Kevin and Eddie, and they're talking to this very strict policewoman called Larson, who's from Denmark, and with no sense of humour. But it's a bit of a play around with, with language. So Kevin starts off. Kevin picks up his fishing rod and shows it to Larson. They're fishing. Kevin. So anyway, Larson, this is my rod. Eddie. Ha! Kevin, what? Eddie, nothing, Kev. You don't laugh at nothing. It's because you said rod, Kev. That's because this is my rod. Ah! What now? You said it again. I said what again? Rod. Larson. What is wrong with Kevin's rod? <laughs> Larson. It looks a fine rod to me. Eddie and Brian increased up with laughter. Very pleased, Larson. No more. What is wrong with those two? I oh, have no idea. Give me your rod, Kevin. I want to feel it. Be careful. I haven't used it for a couple of months, so it might be a bit stiff. Eddie and Brian are giggling in the background. Think that the truth. Will you two please shut up? Larson, I used to envy my brothers when I was young. I was so jealous that he had one and I didn't. But I used to follow him everywhere so I could watch him. But do you know what was so annoying? He never used it properly. He just played with it. You with me so far? <laughs> <laughs> Brian and Eddie, Eddie are laughing hard. Kevin, do you ever get to have a go with it? Larson, my brother was not very nice to me. But at Christmas and occasionally on my birthday, if I pleaded and was subservient to him, he would let me go with him to the lake so I could really have some fun with it. Brian and Eddie are now out of control. Larson, are you two okay? Eddie, sorry. Larson, do I make you laugh, Eddie? No, Larson, sorry. Eddie pulls himself together. So what is so funny? It's just that in English, rod can mean something else. Like what? Well, rod means dick. Why would a rod be called a dick? Surely rod means rod and dick means dick. If only it was that simple. They're being childish, Larson. I can't, I find speaking English as confusing as its people. Why can't a word mean what it says? This is a rod, nothing else. Kevin, well, technically it's a fishing rod. So what does that mean? It can be the name of someone else as well. I mean, there's a bloke in Bridmouth called Rod. He runs the post office. So there are people Named after a fishing rod? No, they are called Rodney, but it's often short to rod. As in fishing rod? No, just rod. But then Eddie said that rod is another name for Dick, and I thought Dick was the name of someone. My father was friendly with a man called Dick, which he said was short for the name Richard, but he never mentioned he could be called Rod too. Oh, <laughs> I suppose it's a bit odd, but we have different names for people. Never mind. <laughs> so that's a bit of a bit of lads. So, back to the playwriting. The road is rocky and hard enough, but I've always believed theatre should be fun. I've never tried to be hard on actors and always insisted that they enjoy themselves. I was never too precious about my lines. I just wanted the actors to believe in the characters I've written because they would then act, act naturally in accordance with each other, even if they lost their specific lines. In fact, I remember rehearsing Clash of Wills, that comedy, three days before we were due to open. I think how well things were going. 
But something was bothering me. And what was it? But then I had a heart attack. Everyone was still reading off script. Three days before we were due to start. Never have so many lines been learned by so many people in such a little time. <laughs> Momentum was building. And because I had access for my place to be formed and was running, writing profusely, next up was a romantic play called Here Crocs and Hands, which was performed, of course, at the Athenaeum in the autumn of 1987. How many remember that? There it is. Um, and what a wonderful place it was. Um, the play was set in the artistic quarter of Paris. It was an examination of the trials of a woman trying to love and support a struggling artist in Paris or withholding from them the truth of how she does it. It also questions the value of art and whether its status is somewhat inflated. We often use the revolving stage. Wow. Which, unfortunately, sometimes got a bit stuck. So we actually worked out a way of developing scene changes where people would come on and surreptitiously <laughs> push the, the stage around. Um, and we also then decided to borrow a saxophonist, Mark Joseph, to cover these pauses as we return to the stage around. But it was great fun, it's a great theatre, and hopefully we'll be back there one day. We also have music from Marco Stacy, which had another dimension to everything. Um, and it was also the first time that the Theatre Royal actually deigned to uh, give me their time, and they did a read through of Peacocks and Hands by the Orchard Theatre in the drum which was a, a great privilege. So plays were flying off my pen, and the next play was done to celebrate the 1988 Amada 400 celebrations. Entitled Drake, it concentrated on Drake's circumcision of the world, and it had its first run through at the Devon Court Guild. Please walk. Sorry? <laughs> what did I say? You said circumnavigation. Oh, circumnavigation. Yeah, that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Was he a writer? Was he a writer? Tell him a writer. So, this was our play we did at Devon Court Guild Hall, again starring Mr. Blackwell and Mr. Hutchings as the very evil of the Calde. <laughs> Um, again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was here that I experienced um, a very humbling moment again. At the time, Devonport was quite deprived. And while we were rehearsing, there were lots of kids hanging around. So I paid them in cigarettes to mind our cars during rehearsals. And they became fascinated about what was going on. Eventually, I let them into our dress rehearsals. But at the interval, the actors were up in arms. The kids had never been to theatre before and were chatting and laughing at the performance. I said that instead of throwing them out, that just should rise to the occasion to make them more engaged. They did. And it was such a success that we took some of them on to shift props during scene changes. On the final night, some of the kids came up to me and said they so enjoyed the experience they wanted to write a play about themselves. I was taken aback but didn't know how to take things forward, so I jibbed out on what could have been an amazing experience. Still, we live and learn. We were now set up for the summer production of, at the Barbican Theatre, and I had found ourselves in an interesting situation. The Theatre Royal was running a musical called Drake at exactly the same time we were running the play of the same title at the Barbican Theatre. Oh dear. What a to-do. Still, I was always one for taking advantage, so I agreed a deal. I changed the name of Drake to Drake the Adventurer, in exchange for official support from the Theatre Royal on all our publicity and a free leaflet drop to their thousands of track members. Not sure how it went down at the Theatre Royal, but we had full houses and a great reception. We partnered up with a local youth organisation who made all our costumes and produced a stunning, stunning theatre programme, Care of Your Very Own, John Hutchings. We had a lot of support from Plymouth Sound and from the Barbican Traders. So. That was the programme that we had done, 75p, it was a bargain. <laughs> and that raised over two and a half thousand pounds, which back then was pretty impressive. Thank you, John. Who actually was offered a job with the people that he did the programme for. It was so good. Next up was the follow-up to Clash Wheels, which was a Battle of Wits. This was, this was performed at Sherwood Church on North Hill. 
and kept things ticking along nicely. Even the re if, if reviews were improving. And that's probably due to the direction of John Hutchings, I think. <laughs> so. Yeah, so the reviews. Battle of Wits is a sparky, amusing, and distinctive story about community and culture. There is a winning theatricality to the writing with a well-judged and vivid setting and an intimate yet ambitious ensemble cast. The pub setting and Davies' hope of being named manager provide rich symbolism for Britain's current political debates. The dialogue is frequently amusing, especially with regards to Ship's Company and Brenda, and is an entertaining and thoughtful piece of theatre. Plymouth pre Presents even produced a cabaret night at the Good Companions in support of Plymouth Sound's Christmas charity appeal. I like to think my writing was ever improving, and so it was that I wrote my final piece at that time, which was a play about Marilyn Monroe. Simply called Marilyn, played the packed houses at the Barbican Theatre in the summer of 1989, and actually had some good critical reviews. And there you will see Mr. Blackwell and Jane Trigana. And both these uh, ex-members of Plymouth Presents are back to do our 1588 production in two weeks' time at Marjans, which is very exciting. Oh, and that is um, a picture by Brian Pollard that I did, but that comes on in a minute, when we did um, an audio version of what we were talking about. So, however, despite all my efforts, I couldn't seem to make any headway certainly with the Theatre Royal, who I saw at the time as the natural place to support me. I was nearly 30, doing odd jobs to survive and felt frustrated. Plymouth had presented at the time had run its course, so with a heavy heart I wound it down and looked to see how else I could carry on playwriting when there was such little money in it. The answer was to come in 1992, when I created a weekend radio station called Kick FM, which promoted local bands. The whole thing was pre-recorded, and it made me wonder if recording my place and selling the recording <coughs> would perhaps work. It was an idea that I fostered and turned into reality ne nearly a decade later. In the meantime, I went off to London, kept sending off scripts to no avail, and tried unsuccessfully to get produced. I still chose to write in verse with large cast plays and felt an inner belief that it is worth pursuing because I had seen and felt the audiences respond on plays and knew that they were connecting with them. In 1998, I financed the recording of Battle of Wits and made them into copies with Brian Pollard's painting of the hoe at the front. So this was, again, trying to think of how to make a living out of playwriting because as much as it's the greatest form of art, I'd like to think, it only exists on the night of the play. It's a very collaborative form. And to me, a script is the same as if I was giving you Instead of going to a band, just showing you the lyrics written down, it's just not the same. But it was this frustration of certainly being at Plymouth at the time, you couldn't get your work out, people, people in London wouldn't come down to see it. So I was trying to think of ways of trying to capture this so that I could, you know, make more advantage of it. So that's where my thinking was going at the time. So I was in London. Um, working at ITV, and I was there for the first internet boom in, in the year 2000. I just turned 30, and I needed to give playwriting another go. At the time, the government were giving out loans to new businesses, which were guaranteed by the DTI. So sensing an opportunity, I wrote a business plan for a company I called Plays on the Net. Now this was in 2000, but hey, the, the internet was always, always screaming for content. And I'd seen from myself how the establishment was very precious of allowing new work through its doors. I decided to open up the floor with a model where I would produce this place in an audio format for downloading on the internet in exchange for a 50-50 split. The model was working for music with MP3, so why not theatre? At the time, ITV were merging into one company. So I took a redundancy package and invested the money on a website from Boss Interactive. I then got in touch with a new digital radio station called One Word, which was setting up as a potential rival to Radio 4. The programming controller was Paul Kent. We negotiated that I would supply him new audio play once a week on Saturday nights for free. 
It meant excellent publicity for me and gave a boost for writers to submit their scripts to plays on the net. And it worked. Scripts started to come in from around the world and I remember recording one from a writer in Australia with him listening on the phone. In all, uh, I recorded 54 hours of original drama for one word and had three of the plays nominated for Sony Awards. It was at this time that Paul mentioned that I should go to the BBC to see if they wanted any help with moving their audio books online. I was still struggling to get anyone to understand what I was up to and remember being stared at incredulously when I said that I thought in the future it would be possible to down download films into your phone. Never happened. Anyway, I duly turned up at BBC Audio Books in Bath to talk to them about downloads. They said they were beginning to look into it and asked if they could give, give me three plays to trial. Uh, yes, please. So off I trotted with Alan Bennett's Talking Heads, Romeo and Juliet and Macbeth. I uploaded them onto plays on there and got all my friends to try and download them for money through PayPal. Of course, this was the time when it took as long to download in real time. So I think FE's, everyone's failed. However, um, I gave them the money and uh, they pretended that they had received it. So I was able to send a cheque for £173 to the BBC, which they pinned on their notes board in the canteen. Well, that's how blasé they were about it. However, I'd just become the first company in the world to successfully trial the download of paid content on the internet for the BBC, even ahead of Audible. Unfortunately, it was another two years before people grasped what I had achieved. And when they did, I was able to sell plays on that to an American media company called Dolphin Digital Entertainment. So this is a, that's Paul Kent and that's me, a younger looking me, plays on that and one word. Naturally, I had my own place on places on that, and a new adventure was to begin when I had an email from a certain Jason Grant in New York to see if I could stage a read-through of Marilyn as part of a festival of British talent. Of course I replied. And in June 2005, my partner Mel and I flew to New York to see it. I was awestruck to see my name on a poster in New York, and the reading was to share the bill with Neil Innes. There were around 300 people in the restaurant theatre, including people who had actually met Marilyn. So I was thrilled when members of the audience said how much they had enjoyed it. It also opened my eyes to the possibilities of New York. I joined the New York-based Theatre Resources United and started to enter various competitions. Eventually this resulted in me being accepted in the 2013 New York Midtown International Theatre Festival. The only drawback was I had to produce and direct it myself. Still, never one to shirk a challenge. I flew to New York, and under the mentorship of Richard she Richmond Shepherd, got a cast together and produced a play for 10 nights, all in the space of six weeks. I used exactly the same methods I used with Plymouth Present all those years ago, and was just pleased to see how well it worked. I even had a review in the Huffington Post. But it was pretty ruthless out there, and the one thing I did learn is it's show business. That's how they describe it, show business. There are no subtleties in New York, so everyone is a lot more willing to help each other. There are no, um, and another thing which was out there, which I found really interesting, was that they did a writer, director, speed dating, speed dating exercise, where I had to pitch my plays to top theatre producers, producers, including the producer of Spider-Man. It was here that I met Angie Christick, who was to take my place to the next level. Over the next two years, she produced and directed to win a crown of thorns, which I had rewritten from my original Cromwell, and Peacocks and Hens in both New York and Paris. And for both my ventures to New York and Paris, I have to thank Kevin Kelway of Dorcas Media for a sponsorship money from the likes of Marjant and Suzanne Sparrow. Interestingly, I found my theatre notes for the New York Theatre Programme recently and still feel they're relevant today. The reason I got so excited about writing about Marilyn Monroe is that most of the things she was fighting in the late 50s gave her the right to be angry with the system and the men she had to work with. At the time, the US and capitalism was at their zenith and felt invincible. However, as we are now aware, this dominance was built on exploitation, manipulation, 
and an alienation from the core values of what makes society cohesive. I'm fascinated by why Mariners still hold such a powerful position around the world. I feel that this is because she connects with us a bit like perhaps Princess Diana did. We sort of all know deep down that the Western world has certain hypocritical values and feel genuinely moved when someone questions them. Marilyn is a truly historical figure and I like to think that I've given her a fair representation of this play. The story revolves around her reminiscing about her life with her makeup artist and a mystical man who culminates in her death. I wanted to show that whoever we are, whether famous or not, we should always find the courage to stand up and fight for what we believe in. I believe in theatre, believe in the challenges of plays, and I've no doubt if I could find a producer, it would appeal to people from all walks of life. With the emergence of the Me Too movement, I believe the play is extremely relevant and will attract not only excellent actors but an audience as well. So, this was another little photograph I found. Mr. Calway, star over there, another star of my shows. And this was the show that we did in Paris with all the actors. Very, very cosmopolitan, but yeah, it was fantastic fun. Um, a little story there, Kevin came over just to sort, sort of support her, support me, but ended up being the main character. We lost somebody. So on the back of my success abroad, I decided to return my thoughts to home. And in 2017, embarked on an MA creative, creative writing course at the University of Plymouth. Anthony Kalashu has pioneered this fantastic opportunity for local writers over the years, and it gave me the chance to test the standard of my work against real professionals. I've learned a lot and reworked my original Clash of Wheels script into Bartholomew's script. Strip. Having passed the MA, I chose to stay on for my PhD, and I'm now in the final throes of it. My thesis was to understand the position of verse and historical plays in the modern theatrical canon, and I again massively revamped an old script, Drake, into a study of the Spanish Armada of 1588. The stage reading of this will take place on March 19th, 7.30 at Marjons, and will include seven members of Plymouth Presents and X eight ex-students from Marjon's drama department. The stage reading is a prelude to performing Bartholomew Strip at Marjon's in June, and sending a recording of it to the Edinburgh Fringe, where it will be shown online. So where does the future lie? Bringing all my experiences together means that I can start to produce new plays in Plymouth that can be shown around the world. There are a lot of really good writers in Plymouth, and that now there are the opportunities to improve their craft like never before. And I've Come full circle, in which case, perhaps being here and being given the chance to talk about my journey yields the true glory. <laughs>